Professor Michel Lamont from Harvard, who uh, will start uh, the proceedings of these three day uh, meetings by her presentation on the evaluative practices. And uh, I should say from the start that this is, of course, a spin off of the book which some of you may know and which will be in the library soon so that everybody can consult it. It's called How Professors Think inside the curious world of academic judgment. I presume that today there will be also uh, a talk of Michelle will be linked to the text which was circulated, which compares evaluative practices of the uh, US academic panels and uh, academic panels in Finland. Uh, on the other hand, uh, of course, our uh, distinguished lecturer might turn the argument today to a different concern. I should say that uh, we have encountered uh, the work of Michelle for years now and it's really a pleasure that she has made it to St. Petersburg on a scholarly visit. Uh, some of us have uh, noticed uh, one of the first articles to evaluate the stardom of people like Foucault and Derrida and that was an early article in 1987 which considered the academic career of Jacques Derrida from a sociological standpoint. Then, of course, came the book which many people wanted to emulate, but few of it uh, tried, I'm not saying achieved anything comparable, which is uh, money, morals and manners. And then came the book which is hardest for me to understand, given the fact I never studied the working class, but that's the dignity of the working man. Though I should look into the mirror from time to time and read it more attentively. Uh, now, the latest thing, as uh, Michelle was telling me, which links her current concerns to uh, the STS concerns, is the book uh, which she uh, could have brought with her, which has just been published under the editorship of Michelle and uh, two other people in the States, I presume, uh, which considers the application of the STS methodology to the study, to the study of social sciences rather than uh, natural sciences finally will be studied in the same way. The principle of symmetry will prevail. Uh, now, uh, Michelle, once again, might uh, touch on these topics, maybe in the questions and answers period. We presume that uh, we'll be having initially a keynote address, then questions and answers, then we'll have a short break. And then uh, Mikhail Sokolov will offer his reflections on uh, uh, dynamics of virtue and vice in the academic professorship, which simultaneously is a reflection on the work of Professor Lamont. Without further ado, I give this podium a rostrum to Professor Lamont, please. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here, and I thank you for the invitation. It's especially a pleasure to be here at this momentous time when uh, it seems that STS is uh, uh, benefiting from a, a surge of interest here in uh, St. Petersburg. And I partly thank uh, Oleg for uh, inviting me. We met uh, two summers ago, had a wonderful exchange at a, uh, an Italian restaurant nearby, and uh, we both were left hungry for more exchange. So I'm very happy that we were able to arrange this. And I also thank Mikhail for argue, uh, agreeing to comment on my presentation, as when he was assigned to me as a uh, discussant, I didn't know the depth of his knowledge about my topic and how fruitful this exchange could be. Uh, I will not be the ugly North American who comes here and tells you how it should be done. As a, I'm a Quebecois, I must say, and because of this reason, um, I'm partly sensitive to the issue of trying to impose norms of uh, academic productions to other environment. To me, as a sociologist, it's far more interesting to understand the, conduction, the, the conditions that might help us explain why evaluation is set up the way it is in the various community. And if anything, I hope that my book, How Professors Think, uh, could be helpful to people here, not in providing a model to be emulated, but more in feeding a collective discussion 
about how it is done and how it could be improved at the margin, given not only uh, the, uh, the way that higher education and research is set up, the way that distributions of rewards are currently set up here, but also the process through which individuals are socialized into evaluation as they are going to graduate school. One of the key argument of my book is that one of the reasons why peer review works the way it works in the US is that you have 3,000 universities that are spread out over an enormous territory and it's a world that is extremely uh, hierarchalized with, uh, we often talk, think about the top 10 universities, you know, the Harvard, Stanford, Berkeley, as defining what American universities are about, but that is the very, very tip of the iceberg. And in fact, the vast majority of American universities function under different rules. I have a student who did a study of multiculturalism in English departments, comparing two elite universities and two community colleges. And she found that in elite universities, such as Duke, departments would simply proclaim, yes, we're for diversity, and then the star professors could just do what they wanted in their classroom when it came to teaching diversity, whereas in the community colleges, all the professors had to sign a statement and have at the beginning of their syllabus, yes, I will commit myself to diversity, and then they had to follow extremely formulaic ways of doing it. So I think one of the big problems in the study of American higher education is that there's huge imperialism from the top which I represent teaching at Harvard. But one of the things, serious things that sociologists of higher education are doing now is really to develop a much more finely grained understanding of how knowledge production varies in the various uh, parts of this highly stratified system. But the key, the key argument here is really that the question of peer review is tied to the question of the formation of the self. What kind of self do academics have? And what do they do that allows them to maintain or to believe or not? Where do they find the value of their work? So what I found when I wrote How Professors Think, the earlier title, was Cream Rising. And it was Cream Rising because I found that the majority of the people I interviewed for this book believed that the peer review system worked. And I argued that one of the reasons it worked is that, especially in the social sciences and the humanities, you operate in a world in which it's extremely difficult to black box reputation, to use a Bruno Latour term, that is to, to, to consolidate a consensus about who's on top of whom. And one of the ways that this consensus is consolidated is to be invited to sit on, in these national competitions and be asked to judge the work of your peers. And when you have competitions like the American Council for Learned Societies that distributes uh, fellowships to uh, uh, full professors, associate professors, uh, assistant professors across all universities, you have 900 applicants, you have 660 people who receive fellowships. These fellowships are undoubtedly marks of quality. And when people come up for tenure, everyone knows that if you get one of these, it's because you know, your work has been acknowledged as being superior. So there's, in terms of the production of the stratification system internally, the, uh, the uh, surplus value that is associated with these fellowships is enormous. And concurrently, the prestige that is associated with being asked to serve on such panel is also very considerable because by accepting to serve, people accept to serve not only because they, it allows them to set the agenda for their field, that is to decide what kind of work should be funded, but also because it is a mark of distinction. And people are told and people believe that they are asked to serve not only because their work is highly influential and they are recognized by their colleagues as partly uh, distinguished scholars, but also because they are viewed as people who have good judgment and who are fair and whose judgment is respected by the peers. And this worked like this in part because the people who are in charge of inviting the panelists to serve on these national committees are themselves often um, 
you know, there are people who uh, might have had been denied tenure at the top university. They are selected because they strongly believe in the system. And uh, when they decide who to invite, they survey the environment to determine who would be a good panelist. So all this, these factors work together to, to legitimize the system. Now, one of the big questions of the book, which I don't raise in the book, but which is the, the, the complementary agenda, would be to see whether people who are at the periphery of the system believe in it as much as people who are at the center. So how about people who never apply for fellowships? How about people who teach at Idaho State University in you know, the middle of nowhere? We don't have the answer to this, but we have data to answer the question. Because um, uh, three years ago, I chaired for the Canadian uh, Social Science and Humanities Research Council a commission charged with evaluating peer review practices. That organization is the equivalent of the National Science Foundation. It, di it, it distributes grants and fellowships to, um, to graduate students, postdocs, and faculty members all over Canada. And part of the research involved doing a survey with 10,000 academics, who many of whom had never applied for money, many of whom had never served, and really this will help you know, analyzing this data would allow us to have a much fully formed uh, picture of what at least Canadian higher education looks like in terms of how people believe the system works or should work. So um, the paper I'm going to discuss today is uh, the paper that, uh, like mentioned, had, I, I don't know, been uh, circulated which is really a comparison of some of the findings from uh, how professors think with a, um, uh, a competition that is uh, conducted by the Academy of Finland. And you would think, why the Academy of Finland? It's partly important because there is a program called Norface to which uh, a dozen European countries have uh, joined, often small countries, like Norway, where the academic community is very, very limited and where the network density is such that it is very difficult to believe that people would be able to judge because they're judging, in fact, people next door. So many of these smaller countries, and there again I sympathize as a Quebecois, which has a very, Quebec has a very small uh, academic community, uh, the idea of uh, putting together engineering, it's really a matter of setup. How do you engineer procedures of evaluation where all these little countries are pulling together their resources so that they have a common pool of non-Danes evaluating the Danes, non-Portuguese evaluating Portu uh, Portuguese evaluators, to really try to disentangle the very complex um, and dangerous overlap between network density and similarity in criteria of evaluation. One of the things I find in my study is that very often people define as excellent what looks like their own work. What is excellent is, you know, people who do the same kind of work I do. And, you know, we're not holy spirits, you know. It's very hard for us as academics to step out of our criteria or our own visions of what is good, in part because our, our tastes are formed by the community in which we live. And also academics think that they're being asked to serve precisely because they're experts. So for instance, just to take a random example, Oleg has spent 20, 30 years developing an expertise in his field in sociology. He has an extremely detailed categorization system by which he is able to see what is new, what has been done before, what is old hat, what has potential. So like me, he's also excited more by some agendas than by others. And one of the reasons he's asked to evaluate is precisely because his understanding of what is exciting is based on this enormous knowledge that he has. So people believe they're asked to serve in part because they have this knowledge. They are, because of the knowledge, they are qualified to do judgments of expertise, which have to do with quality of execution. But they're also asked to make judgments of taste, which is what excites me. And this judgment, this criteria of excitement, is extremely dangerous, because that's where idiosyncrasies come in. 
So I will mention, for instance, some of the people I interviewed who say, I'm a dancer, I love dance, therefore I stood up and I defended this proposal on dance. That's not an intellectual argument. So it's a total argument that has to do with idiosyncratic taste. But the issue is how do you bracket those idiosyncratic tastes when you're asked to do a job that is relatively, you know, where you are using universalistic criteria. But at the same time, many people believe they are there precisely because they have good taste. And I would say that this is even truer for disciplines where standards of excellence, of expertise are, are fuzzy. And I think it's even truer in the social sciences and the humanities because unfortunately in our disciplines <coughs> we don't have million dollar grants that would help, or we have very few of them, that would really help consolidate the picking order among academics. Which means that it, this, the status hierarchy is often up for grab and people will very easily try to, wait to, to throw their weight around and the conflicts in evaluation panels are often more violent precisely because they become a theater for the contest in, in uh, cr the creation of pecking order. Uh, a friend of mine who is a, a physicist was noting that in his opinion the conflicts among social scientists are much more acute in, and I was saying yes, it's in part because you guys, you know, who got the multi, multi-million dollar grant is not the topic of debate. Whereas in our case, the small differences are much. Uh, so these preliminary remarks is, are leading me to two points, which is first the need for a more systematic analysis of uh, the conditions for social knowledge production, evaluation, and application. And Oleg mentioned uh, the book that just came out, titled uh, Social Knowledge in the Making, which I co-edited with uh, Charles Kamek and Neil Gross, just came out at University of uh, Chicago Press. And what this book attempts to do, it's fairly ambitious, is to try to propose for the social sciences an agenda that parallels what STS has done for science and technology, bringing together the enormous amount of knowledge that we've already amassed when it comes to the history of the social sciences, the sociology of knowledge, the sociology of, uh, of um, you know, uh, uh, soci social sciences in general, to say, okay, if we look at the unfolding laboratory of your life, we're gonna have Wilgard here for the weekend, the unfolding of knowledge production and evaluation at the ground level, what happens if we follow people just the way that Latour and Wilgard followed them in laboratory to see exactly what are the context of knowledge production evaluation. That's what I try to do in my book and what I'm gonna, I did in the paper I'm gonna to present today. But the argument is very much, you know, to look at uh, knowledge production in the making. The chapters, for instance, just to give you an idea, looks at the seminar as an organizational form, looks at the library, looks at the role of deadline. I think if all of us didn't have deadline, we would all be very unproductive. So there's a beautiful chapter of, about that follows a philosopher producing a paper and how you know, he forces himself to have this deadline and then he has to fly in Paris and instead of visiting Paris, he's stuck in his room finishing his paper. You know, and uh, how, the, I'm sure you've all been there, I've been there certainly, I spent part of the day in my room <laughs> instead of going around. So, um, so all these conditions, the spatial and temporal context in which knowledge is being produced and evaluated. In the groups I studied, for instance, you know, basically you take a bunch of academics who've never met each other, you fly them to downtown Manhattan, you put them in a, you know, skyscraper, typically like the 32nd floor, windowless room for two days, you lock them up in there, you give them a pile of maybe a hundred proposals that they need to discuss, they have two days to do it, of course, the first few proposals they discuss, it takes forever, because what are they doing? They're a little bit like dogs marking their terrain. They're explaining what they have done in the past that makes them partially qualified to talk about proposals in rhetoric or in Chinese history or whatever. Each proposal that is being discussed becomes the occasion for them, presentation of self. Very, lots of narcissism going on. You know, I did this, I did that, I did that, it takes forever. 
and uh, at the same time they are pre presenting their credentials. So they are engaging in presentation of self. And we see here the context of the deliberation as being shaped by interaction. Individuals who don't want to walk out of the room after two days, feeling that no one listened to them. Right? This is extremely frustrating. So they establish their credentials and um, the um, uh, so, so really analyzing, I analyze this in the context of, uh, of interaction. The other general point is really that um, this, this approach cannot be transposed everywhere. I recently wrote a, an introduction to uh, the translation. My book is going to come out in Chinese. And one of the arguments of the book is that deliberative democracy is a mode of deliberation that is very much tied to a political tradition. What happens is you transpose it in China, where the academic world does not have this culture of political <coughs> democracy, where this notion of turn-taking, of uh, you know, free expression around the table simply doesn't work at all. So there's a huge number of questions that need to be asked about what happened when, you know, it's not again a question of emulating American practices. It's more a question of understanding how the peer review practices become hybridized by the local context in which they are transposed. Um, over the last two years, there's been debates about my book in places like Italy, and now there's going to be one in Spain, places, Southern Europe, very well known for the clientelistic culture that predominates in academia. And young people who are really fed up about this have created electronic journals, which they can do for free, to really circumvent the role of the, uh, the gatekeepers who are older people whose own positions have been based on the control of publishing houses and journals. So they have, they're really trying to change, the, to me it's a little bit like the Arab Spring of Italian academia. They're trying to change the rule from the bottom. And uh, in that context, they're kind of using my book to, force, you know, to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to shake the, to shake the, uh, the system and, and bring about a, a collective reflection about how it could be done otherwise. So now I'm going to jump into the, the presentation of this comparison. I will simply say one point I was developing earlier that I didn't completely finish is you know the importance of time and space. I mentioned these people stuck in the building, the, the skyscraper in downtown Manhattan. The problem is they have two hours to do it. And they know that at 5 o'clock on Tuesday, everyone leaves and flies back to uh, Los Angeles and Chicago and, uh, and Idaho. And uh, this really influences the conditions under which the deliberations are carried. The more times pass, the less and less time people are spending on each proposal, and the more horse trading there is. So I'm not at all arguing here that the American system is pure. You know, there's tons of horse trading, there's tons of alliances. They're simply not practiced the same way, maybe, than they are in Italy. People will simply not say, you help me this time, I'll help you. People will never say that. But of course, they do do it. OK, so some background on my project. It was a comparison of um, five uh, nationally uh, very prestigious competitions for fellowships and grants that were distributed by the Social Science Research Council, the uh, American Council for Learned Society, the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowships uh, that gives fellowships in the social sciences and the humanities, and two very prestigious anonymous foundations that have agreed to uh, contribute. One of them uh, is a Society of Fellow at the, an Ivy League University. So I interviewed people within a few hours or a few days after they had participated in the final deliberation. What does that mean exactly? There's normally two steps. If there's a competition that has 1,300 files, you have associate level professors, uh, people who have their PhD, teach in universities, but don't, are not full professors yet, who will do the screening. I'm not looking at this level. I'm looking at the finalists. There might be, let's say, 100 of them for 30 files. And I'm looking at this meeting where people are getting together and deliberate. And I have, prior to the interview, 
the list, the rankings of the applicants that was published, that was produced by the individual in isolation in their living room before they come together. So a month before the deliberation, they receive this pile, they hide away from their family, and you know, it's a sacrifice because you don't necessarily feel like reading these files on Sunday afternoon. And, uh, and then they give it normally a number, you know, they rank order them, and then they all fax in or email their ranking and the staff people compile them. And when they walk into the room, they are given the list, the final ranking. And then they're really amazed and marvel at the fact that often the tops, there's very high level of overlap in who is ranked the top. And then they feel like, oh, it works. We all share the same criteria for quality. And these people are very quickly given the fellowships, they're not even discussed. The bulk of the discussion is about the people who are in the middle, because people in the middle, normally, they all are good enough to have made it there, but their proposals are all faulty, but they're differently faulty. So the question is, how do you make different kinds of fault commensurable? How do you compare them? So then people are really engaging in little competitions for framing. You know, is the, the proposal dilettantish or is it sufficiently precise? And that's where, you know, the power dynamic kicks in. And in principle, the, the, the panelists are all equal. That's the, presume, the, the assumption of deliberative democracy. You know, they're sitting around a table, but there are huge variation in age, degree of expertise, gender, uh, the prestige of the institution from which they, they come from, but the rule of the game are that the older man who teach at Harvard is not supposed to stand up and say, I'm right because I teach at Harvard. The rule of the game is that the young woman who teach at Oklahoma State is entitled to stand up and make an argument that is reasoned and be listened to, and the only way to counter her is to provide arguments that would be convincing arguments, okay? So this is the setup. Uh, the argument here is not about comparing biases and unbiases evaluation as much as to capture how the evaluation unfolds and how it is carried out and understood by emotional, cognitive, and social human beings who interact uh, with the world through specific frames, narrative, and convention, but who nevertheless are able to develop expert views concerning what defines legitimate and illegitimate assessment. So how I do this, the interview schedule focuses on an approach which I describe as, you know, studying boundary work as a, through interviews. It's a kind of laboratory experiment. The probes are who was the best uh, panelists, why? Who was the worst panelist, why? Who was the most similar to you? Who was the most different from you? When they described to me the worst panelists, who did they talk about? Typically the person who talked about, who had an opinion on everything without having read the proposals very carefully. Uh, the people who did not respect those rules that I'm going to describe. Most of what I'm going to describe today is what I call the customary rules of evaluation. These are rules that you never learn formally. They're never taught to you in a seminar. But you learn how to perform them by watching your professors perform them. And they have to do, for instance, with uh, uh, disciplinary difference. If there's a philosophy proposal being discussed, I'm not supposed to think that my opinion on Wittgenstein has more legitimacy than that of uh, uh, the philosopher in the room. And you, if you don't give deference to the expert, you're very quickly viewed as arrogant and you're singled out as the worst panelist. Um, the, uh, so, so as people are describing these rules in the interviews, by, you know, it's a very Garfinkel, Errol Garfinkel ethno-methodological approach to, to uh, to identifying the taken for granted rules by asking people to describe to me who broke them and why. And who the, the interview schedule is also about who were the best applicants and why. And there's also questions that have to do more generally with their understanding of the culture of academic excellence. So for instance, do you believe in academic excellence? And in the American context, where many people have read Foucault, 
they think of academic excellence as simply, you know, part of the disciplinary process, and they will, some of them will say, no, I don't believe in academic excellence. This is just an ideology. But this year, I'm the one who's been asked to evaluate. And I can certainly do that. So an arbitrariness, and this is partly, I've seen this mostly in people, faculty from anthropology and English. You don't see that in economics because they truly believe that excellence exists and they believe that they can recognize it. They think it's an objective hierarchy. There's also a huge difference in the extent to which they believe that intersubjectivity contributes to the recognition of, of, um, of quality. So for the economists, they think there's an objective ranking here. All we have to do as evaluators is name it, point to it, and give life to it. But they don't think it has anything to do with intersubjective deliberation. Whereas for people who are more attuned to a constructivist paradigm, they will say the hierarchy doesn't exist if we don't name it. You know, we engage in a work of framing where you know, I have to pick out of these 1,000 proposals the one and I'm going to give it voice to. So whether they understand excellence as, or the, the identification of excellence as an uh, intersubjective process or not varies enormously with the disciplinary culture from which people are emerging. One of the chapters of the book is precisely on these interdisciplinary cultures comparing, it goes from economics, the most uh, objectivist discipline, to political science, which in the US has basically been colonized by economics. Many political scientists wish they were economists. And then history, which remains very much Verstian, you know, comprehensive approach uh, and ideographic. Uh, anthropology and English, which are the two disciplines that have faced the greatest um, legitimation crisis because uh, the, liter the, the literature on the construction of the canon means that uh, those two disciplines are viewed now as either very uh, inward looking, the case of uh, anthropology where many other disciplines are now studying culture and the anthropologists are standing and saying, I'm the one who knows culture and all of you guys don't really know what you're doing. They're saying that of course to, to people in English studies where cultural studies is located and in uh, sociology and in uh, cultural history. And then you have, and you know, and English really is perceived by many as a discipline that is facing, you know, as being self-destructive for the last 20 years. And finally, philosophy, which uh, is very paradoxical because uh, they think they're at the top of the heap, but many people think it's a discipline that has become obsolete because they're unable to explain to anyone on what their superiority is based, and they're very, uh, you know, proud of what they're doing, and you know, unable to explain their, their, uh, why they're, where they're useful. So uh, very, very different disciplinary cultures that are also characterized by different degree of consensus internally. The two disciplines that have the highest degree of consensus are economics and history, but the consensus are based on totally different things. In economics, it's basically mathematical formalism and a uh, canonization of the key texts, whereas in history they say, and that was totally unanticipated for me, that they recognize good craft when they see it. So they say, although there's huge differences between people who do post-colonial history and people who do military history, we all recognize the craft, a historian who masters the craft of his discipline when we see it. So they, and it's also the biggest discipline. In all these competitions I studied, it's the discipline that gets the largest proportion of rewards, of, uh, of awards rather, and um, they're also the ones who apply the most. So I don't know if it is the case elsewhere. It's an enormous discipline. People forget this. History is enormous. In part because, you know, people have, uh, every university uh, student has to take history courses, which is not the case for sociology or for, or for philosophy. So I've described to you the interview schedule. So to summarize, uh, very specific questions where I'm asking them to perform boundary work as they describe to me what happened. You know, which was the top, I'm asking concretely, which is the proposal that received the highest grade? What argument did you make? What argument did the other panelists make? In, uh, what ways were these arguments similar and different? So I'm literally following the object through accounts, a very Latourian 
technique. Uh, and I was also able to uh, sit on three different panels. But most of the, the research is not on the panels. And I also consider their answers to the most general question that tries to tap the cultural templates through which they define excellence. Who is your best student ever? By what criteria did this person shine? Brilliance, originality, because the book was also very much concerned with fleshing out the meaning that is associated with the criteria of evaluation. Those criteria are given to them by the funding organization. They are typically originality, intellectual significance, social significance, and feasibility. Is the applicant qualified to, uh, to do the project? But what we didn't know is really the meaning assigned to these criteria. For instance, originality doesn't mean the same thing at all in the social sciences as it does in the sciences. What I found, what we found, with my, two of my students who work on this with me, was that most often the word originality is used to mean asking new questions and developing new approach. You know, asking questions that have never been asked before, which is kind of very puzzling when you think about the Popperian or, or Lakatoshian epistemology that uh, has been taught in American social sciences for forever. So, um, Okay, so this is basically the background. Uh, the, uh, I'm also going to be drawing on the work that my collaborator, Katri uh, Hutenemi, who studied the Academy of Finland, uh, the research that she did for dissertation. She studied four panels, and uh, those panels were chosen precisely to have different kinds of mix of expertise than the panel I had studied. One of them is unidisciplinary, whereas all my panels were multidisciplinary. They had different kinds of expertise. One of them had citizens, generalists on the panel, which whereas I did, and we will see that, you know, in line with the work of Harry uh, uh, Collins and John Evans, uh, the generalists uh, use very different kinds of arguments, you know. They talk from their heart. It's not arguments, it, they talk about common good and what the, the good of the general public. We also can compare uh, panelists that panels that have only scientists versus those that have um, social scientists. The panels that she studies do not uh, rank proposals. That's a huge difference. My my panels, uh, it's a zero sum game. Not everyone can be number one. Whereas the panel she studied, uh, everyone can get an A. So it, it's a panel where you have two steps. You have the scientific panel that rates, and then you have a decisional panel from the Academy of Finland, composed this one only of, of Finnish people that decide who gets the money. So in some ways, their role is advisory as opposed to decisional, and that also creates a very different uh, dynamic. So um, the, I'll describe to you those five, the, the four panels she studied, and then I'm going to get into the description of these um, uh, customary rules and how they are articulated differently across the, uh, the panels that I studied and she studied. So a first proposal, a first group that she studied, <laughs> I'll summarize to you my, the, I'll highlight some of the findings at the same time as I describe to you some of these panels. So, as I mentioned already, among the most salient customary rules of evaluation we found, the first one is differing to expertise and also respecting disciplinary sovereignty, which manifests themselves differently based on the degree of specialization of the panel members. So basically there's less difference in unidisciplinary panels where the, specialist of pan, uh, the specialties of panelists more often overlap. Basically, if you have a panel made of experts of you know, Syrian archaeology under uh, Greek rules, it's going to be a total disaster because they all know exactly the same things and they don't want to differ to each other. The panels that work best are the multidisciplinary panels where you don't have much overlap. There's a zero-sum game between the people who have very similar uh, expertise. There's also less respect of disciplinary sovereignty in panels concerned with topics such as environment and society that are of interest in what to wider audiences. 
there's more often reference to the role of intuition in grounding decision making in less specialized panels. While there is a rule against the conspicuous display of alliances across all panels, strategic voting or so-called horse trading appears to be less frequent in panels that rate as opposed to rank proposal and those that have an advisory uh, as opposed to a decisional rules. Another customary rule is that of methodological pluralism and cognitive contextualism. Contextualism means evaluating proposals according to the standards of the discipline of the applicants. And these are far more salient in the humanities and social science panels than they are in the pure or applied science panels, where the disciplinary identities of the panelists may be more unified around a notion of scientific consensus including the definition of shared indicators of quality. In other words, the scientists believe that either something is true or not. There's no point about compromising. They have a very different conception of, of uh, where truth resides. Therefore, they're much less likely to uh, engage in methodological pluralism. In our panels, it's not the moment to stand there and think, only qualitative so so uh, social science methods are good. If you do this, you disqualify yourself as a panelist, you're viewed as an imperialist. Uh, you're invited precisely because you're, you're a methodological pluralist. Um, it doesn't work like that in the sciences. And we suggest that there seems to be more concern for consistency in criteria and against idiosyncratic taste in the sciences. So instead of using this analogy of deliber democratic deliberation, which I used to describe the American panel, it seems that the Finnish science panel may be best described as functioning as court of justice, where one panelist whose own expertise is the most removed from the topic of the proposal is put in the position where he makes the case to the other panelist who make the decision. So it's a little bit like using such technologies of evaluation to create, to force a bracketing of interest. So this is really an example of how you know, Karen North Setina writes about technologies of evaluation or mechanic, machineries of evaluation. The way that these panels are set up uh, can have a very big influence on uh, whether or not people are more enabled to protect their paths. Okay? So it does matter. This analogy between the court of justice versus democratic deliberation being two, two examples of ways of, um, uh, of setting up panels. So, so those customary rules, as I said, are never taught. They're never spelled out. People receive from the funding organization a list of criteria. There's no policing because the, pan, the, uh, the program officer who normally presides over the deliberation is often an academic who got the night tenure somewhere. So by the standards of the panelists, they are viewed as lower status. And the panelists are there because of their prestige. So they're often construed by the funding organization as giving legitimacy to, uh, to the deliberation. So there won't be any program officer telling them, well, actually, one of the criteria here is utility. Is the research you know useful for political from the perspective of policy making? So the panelists are very much there as sovereign minds, you know, as free, as uh, free spirit. But they might keep each other in check and offer arguments, counter arguments when uh, others are are uh, not behaving properly. The role of the uh, program officers is really to what they will most often say is, I hear a consensus forming. So they are interpreters of what is going on and therefore agenda setters. They close the debates, you know. They, they, they are the ones in charge of keeping the deliberation going so they can very well decide, okay, we've talked enough about this, now I hear a consensus forming, so they, they close controversies. Their role is very important. Okay, so let's talk now about some of the findings to compare these, uh, these panels more systematically. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention, for the US case, there's 81 uh, open-ended uh, uh, semi, 
structured interviews. And uh, for the uh, Finnish case, there's uh, 18 interviews out of 27 panel members, as well as interviews with, uh, with the panel officers. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do now is describe to you a few of these uh, customary rules. I took a little more time to introduce the project than I was planning to. Take your time. I can take all my time? Okay, I'll slow down then. Am I talking too fast? No? Okay. Yes or no? On the right international students, the Russian students, you will feel by the audience response. Uh -huh. <laughs> Okay, I'll slow down a little bit. Oh, even take time to breathe. Okay. We should have some kind of discussion. <laughs> don't, don't hesitate to interrupt me if you feel like uh, there are points that are not clear enough. So I'm basically going to present to you quotes that illustrate some of these rules and I'm going to show how they differ in the way that they are applied in the US and in Finland. And I'll see whether I'm able to get through all of them. Okay? And this is where the meat, you will see the, the fun stuff because the, uh, a lot of the, the, the project is about seeing how academics talk about or, or what they're doing and how oblivious they can be sometimes to their, to their own practices. So, okay, the first rule is different to expertise and respecting disciplinary uh, sovereignty. So, I, as I said earlier, um, in principle, because this practice is based on demor deliberative democracy, people sit around the table and they are, in principle, enabled to engage in full, equal, and free exchange of opinions through deliberation. But people vary in their age, race, and gender, etc., and they engage in a contest where alternative frames for each proposal is possible. So is the proposal well-written or glib? Is it broad and daring or dilettantish? Uh, is it current or trendy? There's such a small margin between current and trendy, you know? <laughs> Uh, is it painstakingly focused or disappointingly obscure? So panelists formulate interpretive frames and attempt to convince one another that theirs is the most adequate. In this context, this is a context that gives rise to this rule of differing to expertise. So when they want to advocate a position, they invest a lot of energy into staking their rightful claim to evaluate it. As I said earlier, they mark their territory. They provide evidence of their competence. A historian notes that a proposal looks good until somebody says, and that's where those multidisciplinary panels are so interesting, that there's a whole literature you could not reasonably be expected to know. So art history, you know, 15,000 books already on Magritte's later work, you know, how would I know? So basically, people really count on each other around the table. And this really legitimizes the competition because they know that they couldn't do it by themselves. It's impossible. So particularly when listening to someone who, quote, comes in extremely expert and careful and is a person I respect a lot, and this historian finds it prudent to differ. If this expert says this is really a fairly banal proposal, and I just sort of say that it must be true. Okay, this is very different when you have unidisciplinary uh, competition, where if you put Oleg and I in a sociology panel, we have an idea of what's going on in our discipline. And you know, no one can tell me that something is extremely banal without me having an opinion about it. So. The more common form of difference involves what we call the customary rule of respecting disciplinary sovereignty. So the panelists' opinions generally are accorded more weight with regard to the proposal emanating from their field. And violating this rule creates huge conflicts. The biggest conflict I witnessed when I was doing this project was actually in one of the, the panels that I attended where there was a philosopher who was uh, defending a proposal that uh, two feminists on the panel thought uh, 
had implications for a very universalistic notion of uh, human nature, which they thought had been totally destroyed by deconstruction. And, you know, they simply were not ready to let this guy have his way with this Kant proposal. And they prevented the proposal from being funded. And the philosopher who thought of himself as far superior to those two women was extremely upset and he refused to have lunch with them. So he went to sit at the separate table. And that's where the, the program officer had to expand a lot of emotional energy, emotional repair to convince this person to come back at the table. So she said to him, no, no, it's just on this particular one. We really value your opinion. You're extremely respected by all of us. Please come back. So it worked, but it required a lot of work. And this is really an example of a major breach. You cannot do this, you know, you cannot. If an astrophysicist were to tell Oleg and I that the sociology proposal is not good, we would certainly have a fit and feel extremely insulted that this person would have the arrogance of telling us what is good in our field. So unsurprisingly, we find that this rule is more widely respected in the American panels that I study because they're all multidisciplinary. Then in the one Finnish panel that was uni unidisciplinary, that's a panel on environmental ecology. So overlapping expertise makes it difficult for any one panelist to convince others of the value of a proposal when opinions differ. An insulting on sovereignty would result in intense conflict for scientific authority. So while distance lends authority to the view of others, the toughest rivals are those that one is closest to. Durkheim had already written this in the Division of Labor. So uh, this is acknowledged by a uh, Finnish panelist, as one of them puts it, when it was clear that the first person was a real expert on this particular field, which the second person hasn't known, obviously they deferred to this person's opinion, but to change the climate of the discussion, if you're both huge experts in this field, then you can argue about it. So the rule of differing to expertise appears to play out differently, depending on the substantive issue the panel is concerned with. In, in fact, we found that less weight was put on specialized expertise and more was put on general arguments having to do with the common good in the panel Environment and Society, which concerns the social aspects of environmental change. This is a topic that is broadly debated in the wider public, the media, and activists who claim the rights of non-experts to participate in decision makings about issues that affect their lives. So in the eyes of one evaluator serving on this panel, the combination of expert opinion and broader consideration is essential for optimal decision making. So he says, I think you need to have the expert in the field to comment, particularly if there's a proper methodology, or if there's a proper question, because only they really know the literature. However, I do not think we need a wider group to ask bigger questions like, I do think we need a broader group to ask questions such as, is this particular research of sufficient interest for public funding? I also think often non-experts ask sort of idiot questions such as, why do you do this? Which can also be a shock to a specialist. So here we really see the resonance with Collins and Evans book, uh, Rethinking Expertise, which Mikhail will talk about. We also find that the relevance of customary rule of differing to expertise varies with the co-presence of generalists. This is also evident in the Finnish panel where um, panelists talk about integrity and intuition as criteria of evaluation. As one of the panelists says, you could simply put your hand on your heart and then say to each other, do you really honestly think this is a good proposal or an excellent proposal? What do you think really? So it's about intuition, you know, it's not about reasoned argument. So the persuasiveness of a colleague was often enough to convince other panel members, even if in the absence of expertise. So you can see here how the rules of the game are deeply influenced by how the panels are set up. If you have non-experts, the, the kind of arguments that are judge valid might be quite different, simply because they don't have the knowledge needed to, uh, to make arguments based on expertise. Okay, second pragmatic rule that I want to discuss is the use of alliance in strategic voting. 
So many interviewees in the American panel <laughs> reported that they allied themselves with different panelists at different times, and others seem to do the same. They were trying to convince me that this is a panel in which there's no politics, there's no quid pro quo. We are all only looking at the proposal based on their own merit. When they do recognize affinities with other panelists, they often take pains to stress that these are not corrupting influence. That is, we agree simply because we are reasonable people who have similar views. Or they, one would say, you know, I, when this person who I highly respect emits an opinion, I pay specific attention because I really want to know what she thinks. As opposed to, he helped me the last time, I'm going to help him this time, which would really be viewed as illegitimate. So despite this desire for neutrality, many believe that strategic voting and horse trading is to some extent unavoidable. So what is strategic voting? It's the practice of giving a low rank to some proposals, lowballing, in order to increase the likelihood that other proposals will win. It also means boosting the ranking of a mediocre or controversial proposal to improve its chance for funding. Horse trading means enabling the realization of other panelists' objective in the hope that they will reciprocate. While some construe this as non-meritocratic because the horses being traded are not necessarily equivalent, or as one of them may win because of politics as opposed to intrinsic strength. So these two aspects of strategic voting and horse trading uh, vary across panel, especially whether on the basis of whether the panels are charged with rating or ranking. So in a nutshell, the ones that are uh, charged with rating, uh, we see much less uh, horse trading because all of them can have very high uh, ratings, but at the same time, people who, went, who do this, who are in such panels, feel like the procedure can be very meaningless. As one of the most critical panelists explained, there's a problem that we're not ranking the proposal, although we know the proposal very well. If you analyze our grade, it will be a kind of normal distribution. There's a lot of number trees which are useless in very few fives or four, I guess. And I don't think we put any one or just a few two. So the Finnish committees that will take over after us, they are not very much helped by our statement or grading. They will have to do everything again by themselves and do the ranking by their own criteria. I think this whole thing is totally meaningless. So um, critical voices tactically advocated in favor of more strategic behavior, including comparative ranking, but they were deterred to do so by the funding agencies. So uh, what we know in any case is that for the American panels at least, strategic voting and horse trading is almost obligatory, especially in the last ha half day, because people by then know who is about to lose face. So they are much more likely to assist each other. They know that everyone wants to walk out feeling like they've been able to win some. And they all depend on each other to get their pet projects funded. So, uh, you know, I have quotes where they say, I was willing to go along with this one because I knew that this other one I really wanted to be funded was going to be funded. So this emotional dimension, which, by the way, the literature doesn't talk about at all, I think is extremely crucial. You know, people have a strong concept of themselves as, uh, you know, uh, prestigious academics whose opinion should be respected. And again, they want to walk out feeling like they have been able to get at least some of their pet projects funded, and they don't think of this as illegitimate. You know, they think it's normal because they have good judgment. And by definition, there should be good proposals that they appreciate in there. Okay, third rule I'm gonna describe quickly. Methodological pluralism, which goes together with cognitive contextualism. So um, basically, these American panels are not a forum for challenging other methodological or disciplinary tradition. And the panelists abide by this rule of methodological pluralism. They are encouraged and committed to evaluating proposals according to the epistemological and methodological standards that prevail in the discipline of the applicant. 
This is what we call cognitive contextualism, which is summarized in the following quote. So one panelist says, there are differences between people who work with large data sets and quantitative research, and then the very polar opposite, I suppose, folks who are doing community level studies in anthropology. There are such different methodologies that it's hard to say that there's a generalizable standard that applies to both of them. We're, we're all, I think, willing and able to understand the project in their own term. Fortunately, and not try to impose a general standard because it would have been extremely difficult. I wouldn't hold a candidate in political science responsible for what seems to me to be having overly instrumental or diagrammatic ways of understanding what they're do, going to do because they have to have those diagrams. They have to have a certain clarity. They have to have a certain scientism. So basically, the panelists are encouraged to downplay their personal preferences and to assess proposal using the lenses that are distinctive to the applicant's field. If you are an anthropologist and you're evaluating proposals in political science, which is much more positivist as a discipline, you're not supposed to criticize the proposals because they are too positivist, okay? This raises the issue of maintaining consistency in criteria which is complicated by the fact that panelists compare different subsets of proposals. And those proposals are grouped together. They can be grouped together based on shared topics, on comparative relative rankings, so every, all the ones that are between, let's say, 15 and 18, or by approximately in the alphabet. So the subsets that you're comparing are constantly shifting, and what brings these subsets together is shifting too, which means that you're primed to use different criteria for different batches. There's very, very little consistency. And that's a huge problem. Uh, as a uh, historian points out, you have different criteria of evaluation at different times. It does sometimes happen that we get some that are very close to each other. And I always go back again and look at the ones that I thought were, very, were really the best and really the worst and see if they're really all that much different. It's like working yourself through a batch of application or paper or whatever. Your standards kind of evolve as you go through. I don't sort mechanically. Until I've read the whole batch, I don't even know exactly what the standards are going to be. And that I know, that's how I do it. You know, when I grade my students, I have to read everything before starting to give grades because then you have a, it, you know, grading is in some ways really very relational. The, it, the criteria are emergent. While the, the respect of disciplinary difference is salient in those kinds of panels, this principle of mythological pluralism is, appears to be most supported by the epistemology of the social sciences, and especially in the humanities. In a close examination of the Academy of Finland panels, we see that the social science uh, evaluation were indistinguishable from their American counterpart with respect to these rules. But this was not the case for the more scientific panels in Finland, which were much more committed to using consistent standard of evaluation, as opposed to adjusting their judgment to what counts as good work across fields. So this goes hand in hand with the epistemological culture where controversies between what is seen as true and false tend to be less open-ended, as scientific and other types of evidence may be more constrained may more strongly constrain debates in the black boxing process. Moreover, consensus formation may be more central to the identity and possibly evaluative cultures of those scientific disciplines. So an ecologist, for instance, recalls many occasions where the panelists worried about inconsistency. Sometimes we went back to previous applications and said, if we evaluate that in this and that way, then we would have to use the same criteria when we're looking at this one. If we say that the person hasn't been abroad, means this and that, we will have to use the same criteria for another application. application. I think we try to be fair. So an important mean of producing coherent evaluation for the scientists is the harmonization of scale. They would say, how likely is it that this proposal would get into science and nature, or that the result from this uh, research would get into science and nature? So they try to agree on what a grade five would mean, and then they compare all the proposal to it. So there's a real attempt to, uh, to control for variation. A, I think I'm gonna describe only one more uh, rule and then I'm going to stop because I'm taking too much time. So I mentioned earlier that these idiosyncratic tastes. 
So we have to go back to Weber, who reminds us that rational legitimacy comes with the application of impersonal and consistent rules. By trying to bracket their idiosyncratic taste, the panel members help to sustain the collective belief in the fairness of deliberation. I mentioned this English professor who tries to always differentiate between criteria of taste and criteria of uh, competence, arguing that we should always subordinate taste to, to competence. And in doing so, he protects the legitimacy of the process, but he also recognized the role of an individual subjectivity in evaluation. But this panelist is the best panelist of all because most people are seemingly moving from you know, criteria of competence of execution to taste. They don't distinguish those two criteria and they constantly go between, between them. Uh, they seamlessly, I write, they seamlessly fold their idiosyncratic preference and taste into the formal criteria, which is in some ways even more pernicious. For instance, they tend to defend originality in ways that is in line with the type of research that their own work exhibit. As one interviewee acknowledged, evaluators tend to speak like, uh, tend to speak, to like what speaks to their own interest. One of them says, I see scholarly excellence and excitement in this own project about food, possibly because I see resonance with my own life, my own interest, who am I? And other people clearly don't, and that's always a bit of a problem, that excellence is in some ways what looks most like you. So at least he sees it. Many people don't. You know, many people write letters of commendation saying, this is my most stu brightest student ever. His work is uh, doing exactly what I do. So. so during interviews with American panelists, we have multiple examples of how panelists did you send critic shape uh, an idiosyncratic interest shaped their vote. Apparently, equating what looks most like you with excellence is so pervasive as to go unnoticed. Moreover, panelists cannot spell out what defines interesting proposal in the abstract, irrespective of the type of problems that captivates them personally, that excites them. So most behave as if they have no alternative but to use their own personal understanding of what constitutes a fascinating problem in order to do the work that is expected of them. Now, if we look at the Academy of Finland, the natural scientists may be more explicit in their effort to bracket idiosyncratic taste and to avoid self-reproduction than the social scientists. This is suggested by how the environmental science and environmental ecology panels that have mostly scientists on attempt to cancel out idiosyncrasies by relying even more on collective judgment. The role of the group was perceived as crucial for judging the argument and viewpoint trying to find balance. So I mentioned that instead of using deliberative democracy, they have a setup where the, panel, the panelist whose work is most distant from the one of the applicant is uh, put in a position of making a case and the others are playing the role of the jury uh, kind of uh, independent judge who could look at uh, the proposal with more distance. So as we can see, uh, uh, this results in a very different kind of approach. The panel would have to be explicit. A Finnish social science explains the process as follows. The panel would have to be explicit about how we understand the criteria in relation to the application, and the discussions would have to be explicit and substantive. What could detect different perspective around the criteria? I think where, where positions were very different, I would say, this is my take on it. This is how I see it. So um, th there's a recognition of the relativism of judgment in this context. So, you know, basically, where does this leave us? Uh, the paper finishes with an argument in favor of a developing a comparative sociology of evaluative practices, uh, which I think is partly needed at the time when, uh, you know, the World Bank published a big report on how to construct worst class universities. And we've had in Europe all these excellent initiatives which very often take as a point of reference uh, American universities without a sufficient reflection about uh, how the, the templates uh, and peer review stands you know, at the peak of this American approach to excellence. 
uh, without necessarily sufficient uh, understanding of the conditions that makes this system possible, you know, the resource that goes with it, you know, if you have money to keep your graduate students being paid full time in graduate school for five, six years, it means that they have access to an extremely intense uh, system of professional socialization uh, where these uh, customary rules are deeply internalized. And as I've argued, these customary rules are far from being universalistic if you have a system in which uh, idiosyncratic evaluations are happening all the time and when you have a lot of inconsistency in criteria. The big difference, I think, is that you have a system that is driven by market mechanisms, which leads people to believe that it is an open system. I know for me, as I was, I'm Canadian, I went to do my graduate work in France, then I got a postdoc to go to the US, and one of the reasons I, I stayed in the US is because as a young woman then, I could see how I thought it would be easier for me to succeed in universalistic term in a huge system where, you know, when you go on the market after you finish your PhD, you send your application to 60 places and it's a market mechanism at work that determines what you, where you end up. Whereas the Canadian system is a little bit like, I guess, the Russian one in that you have very, very few universities. And therefore, and this is the argument that Michael will develop too, that um, if in a system where you have very little uh, geographic mobility, it's much harder to play a universalistic card. The, our graduate students, their universalistic card is to try to get a paper published in ASR, American Sociological Review or American Journal of Sociology, because they, if they succeed at getting that, they know that they will get interviews in a large number of universities. And in the US, it's even more important to do this because if you don't have it, you might end up living in Alabama, which is really hard for an academic. So, uh, you know, you have different system for people. <laughs> yeah, so what I'm presenting is not at all a neology of the American system. As a sociologist, I'm much more interested in understanding the conditions of possibilities. And this is what I've done today and what I hope is that we can use this kind of analysis to move forward to think more systematically about the conditions for evaluative practices in a non-ethnocentric fashion. Thank you. Victor Wachstein. Okay. Thank you. I have actually two questions. I was intrigued by the notion that the evaluation process is actually a work of framing. So, uh, if I understood this correctly, and if I'm not, just tell me this. Uh, framing involves not only all those explicit mechanisms like uh, customer rules, and so on the merchant of and also a lot of explicit cognitive work. Implementation device, selection, menu making, uh, so called explicit framing. So, what is the connection between explicit and explicit mechanism of evaluation? So, where can we draw this line between this is an explicit framing, like that's a marvelous work, and that's actually a hidden uh, machinery of knowledge. Uh, or should we say that okay, if the evaluation marks are consistent, we can say that there is a hidden work of evaluation going on, and if they are not, some framing uh, and interpretation. So this is my first question. And the second one. Wow. May maybe at the end. <laughs> okay. In some ways, I can make a scholastic distinction between the two. Simply decide arbitrarily that the work that the funding organization does in setting up the uh, evaluation process in you know, the distribution of labor and deciding whether you're going to have you know, rating versus ranking would be, I guess I would describe this more as institutional rules, right? Um, the there's a number of things that are, are speakable and that, would, that are formally given also as rules to the panelists, like you have to desist yourself when your students are being discussed or your colleagues. So there's, you know, in those rules you really see the Weberian approach to rational legal uh, legitimacy at work in that you have to have impersonal rules 
and you have to have clear rules about desisting yourself, which are very much respected, and which people mention as demonstration that the system works. One of the issues there is that there's like, no one asked me to desist myself when the best student of my best friend who teaches at another university is being evaluated. So the specification, which happens all the time, especially at the top because people know each other. So in relation to the Russian system, I think, you know, the difference at that level are not that great. You know, probably there's the ties between the St. Petersburg department and the Moscow department are as tight as those between Harvard and Columbia and Yale and Chicago. So, you know, we don't want to yield it to have a too uh, idealistic view of the American system there. So the informal rules, um, you know, I describe them at times using a Goffmanian concept of frame. Uh, I think I'm not partly wedded to this, you know. I think that we could also describe them using other concepts, like uh, the concept of repertoire, or uh, what I know is that, um, you know, using a kind of ethnomethodological approach to see what emerges, you know, basically what I care is to think of them as meaning making and as taken for granted. Uh, rules that emerge when they describe people who break the rules and how angry they are when they describe them. So, otherwise I think it's basically an analytical issue of which framework you prefer to use. I'm a very pluralistic person when it comes to this. I published last year a paper with Mario Small um, which is on uh, the concept of culture that has been used in the literature on, on uh, poverty which reviews uh, six different concepts that cultural sociologists have been uh, using for the last few years to look at the relationship between culture and poverty. And for those of you who want to have a quick introduction to the current state of cultural sociology in the US, it's very much a paper that was written for economists and demographers, people who continue to have a notion of culture that uh, arcing back to the culture of poverty argument or to Parson. And we say most demographers, economists, epidemiologists think of culture as values. In fact, that's not at all what we're talking about. We're talking about frame, narrative, institutions, uh, habitus, and we describe them very concretely. So uh, I'm j this is a long way to say I don't really care about frames. I could use, you know, I'm more of a Gertzian in some ways. I'm more interested in making, making, and in, yeah, so. Okay. A long way to give a simple answer. Thank you for your talk. I, I just wanted to ask if there is any room dealing with the ideological bias of the panel. Uh, because, of course, I come from the content, context where we often think about, you know, politicizing of the argument, taking into account political correctness issues, so this is my first question, and the second will be about the rule about, uh, on the conflict of interest. Does it emerge somehow when the person avoids to participate or somehow uh, try to submerge his or her opinion when he feels maybe not very articulate with the conflict of interest in the judgment on a particular, not a particular competitor? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, well, my co-author, uh, Neil Gross, has a forthcoming book on politics in academia in the U.S. and, you know, the issue of political orientation, you know, basically uh, most academics are very progressive. The issue is more, I think, the one that was raised by Michael Borovoy's work on public uh, uh, sociology about whether we should be organic intellectuals for the left, essentially. And there the disciplinary differences are huge. I think that in anthropology, for instance, uh, anthropology in the US has a very complicated relationship with its uh, colonial past. And because of that, I think politics and being a uh, uh, compagnon de route for the uh, 
underprivileged is much more central to their identity than it is, for instance, for a sociologist. As a sociologist, you would disqualify yourself, well, not in all circles, but in many circles, if your agenda is uh, very much driven by subaltern studies or by post-colonial studies. The politics is not the criteria of, uh, of, uh, that is highly valued. So I think the answer is it would vary a lot across disciplines in how these criteria can be deployed. But uh, it's not a question of Republicans versus Democrats. You know, everyone basically is progressive. It's more the connection, whether or not political consideration can be explicitly used. Or people might very well defend a proposal that they like for political reasons without using political criteria of evaluation because they know, I remember one case in particular at the uh, Social Science Research Council competition where there was a woman geographer, which is a very politically correct uh, discipline in the US, pushing a proposal which was about uh, you know, uh, capitalism in Latin America and the proposal was considered very faulty by a political scientist because the person who wrote the proposal said, I will measure something, but there was no way that this person could measure anything. So the guy said, you know, she says she's going to do this, but she can't. And the person who, want, who was pushing it for political correctness argument said, well, she wrote this, but she really doesn't mean it. In fact, you know, so, so basically she was putting herself in the position of advocating uh, for the proposal far beyond what was reasonable. And uh, when I interviewed the panelists on this controversy, uh, the political scientist said totally, this person was pushing it for political reason. She was simply not evoking political argument because she knew that she would have lost using political argument. So this is really about taking for granted knowledge of which criteria can be evoked in these kinds of contexts. But it's not that politics is not um, relevant. I'm not sure I understood your question about conflict of interest. Well, I, I think what, what I mean is that, for example, a person who participates in the panel, uh, for instance, he somehow knows the university or the supervisor or the person who applies for the grant. And in this case, uh, he can use his power to persuade others to support this person. Or otherwise, he could say, okay, I give up and I don't participate. So I could, uh, I see, I have this experience of participating in such panels, and I know that there is cultural difference. For example, American researchers will say, well, I see here cult uh, conflict of interest, and we should, this person in particular should not participate in the jury because of, because of affiliation. And another person will say, well, I don't understand what you mean by this concept. Because I have this, you know, reputation, uh, I have this legitimacy of claiming that this is exactly a very good proposal. This yeah. Well, the standard is that you recuse yourself, but in fact there's an enormous gray zone in when people are doing it. Uh, often, and I have quotes in the book where people say, this was a proposal of someone whose work I really don't like, and because of my conflict of interest, I didn't say anything, but I was extremely delighted when I saw that the colleague came to the conclusion that I was hoping for. So in some ways, they are like, you know, having faith in the market mechanism, and if they would, and I see this around me all the time. You know, you lose a lot of points when you try to manipulate things. So people are kind of, you lose legitimacy. So people kind of leave it to the market mechanisms, hoping that things will collapse. So for instance, you know, we could see contexts where colleagues would like someone to be appointed and you really don't want the person to be hired. But instead of uh, intervening and making an argument, you just cross your finger and you hope that it will not materialize for some reason. So, you know, because it's a system where legitimacy is, is um, how would I say, legitimacy is based on consensus building, not on preventing things from happening. Uh, Non-action is often strategically a much sounder thing to do than, than attacking. Attacking comes at a very high price. 
Perish because then you make enemies whom you might need later on when you're trying to promote another agenda. So that is, I don't know, probably quite universal in terms of uh, issues of organizational politics. You know, there's a section in the paper which talks about strategic voting, where American academics realize their interests in and horse trading. Uh, Kevin Platt was wanted to have a question, right? Yeah, okay. uh, I really enjoyed the talk. I, I just wanted, because in the talk, you, several times you addressed your analysis of the problem uh, to what seemed to be a discussion of how we can sort of marginally improve the system in the states or to questions of, you know, what is exportable here and what would be best practices in terms of like trying to transplant these institutions, if at all. And I wonder if you could just disarticulate those two kinds of questions a little bit. You know, what, what is exportable, first of all? Maybe there, there are questions which have to be organized in order, right? What can be done to, to fix the system or improve it in the United States? And then what is completely institutionally and culturally um, unexportable? Um, and what is exportable from the American model. Um, and I had a second question which is related, which is um, not really the topic of the paper, it's the question of your understanding of the success of American institutional models in the academy. What, what you know, is there, an, in your view, an, an actual uh, excellence to these institutional organizations? Is the American Academy actually very good? Um, worth exporting, or is that really just a reflection of, you know, I mean, whatever you want to make a reflection of? <clears throat> well, in the book, I try to stay clear from stating whether the system works or not, in part because I say one can certainly make an empirically informed uh, conclusion about whether a specific uh, decision was fair or not, but I feel like when you make pronouncement on the system as a whole, it's a little bit like cultural uh, cultural work, you know, representational work. You just are spouting ideology, which I, I don't want to do. Um, I feel very much that the strength of the system is its size. You know, you have 3,000 universities, and you know, the fact that you can actually bring into a room people who, and that really puzzles me, they don't even take the time to Google each other, which I would do. You know, they have only very broad template, who is a political scientist, she's an art historian, you know, and then they have stereotype of what the disciplines are like. But this is also, I must say, qualifying my research, a context where they don't lose anything. This is not a zero-sum game that will influence what my students get. You know, I'm just distributing, and these are fairly well-endowed competitions. So people might want to say I'm a philosopher, and the, the program officer says that. They say it's so hard to get any philosophy proposal funded because the philosophers are so oblivious. They don't know how to articulate why their discipline is interesting. So then she tells the panelists, I really have to try to mellow you out toward uh, philosophy so that we get at least, you know, one panelist. But, you know, this is totally different than me with my colleague trying to negotiate who are going to be our graduate students that we're admitting, where, you know, I'm directly affected by the decision in terms of which students I will have to work with. Which, by the way, in our department at least, I cannot say I want to have those three people. You know, the, the, uh, the, the admission committee is not consulting the colleagues, which has a big negative, which is that you end up with students you didn't choose, you know, which is not always great. Um, so what is exportable, I think, is not exportable, which is the size, the, the, physio the physical distance, the size of the market, the fact that it's a system that has a high level of mobility which is also the downside because it goes with neoliberalism. You know, people who are leading their lives disembedded, you know, from, from uh, very stable social fabrics. I'm, you know, there's a lot of negative aspects that go with this. You know, it feeds individualism. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm involved in another project called the Successful Societies, where we're looking at, uh, you know, uh, recognition and other aspects of, you know, new book forthcoming title, Social Resilience in the Neoliberal Age, which is really looking at the counterparts of this, you know, of uh, what life in neoliberal societies look like. And the system that makes this possible is a neoliberal system, 
one where people are extremely focused on their personal success and where we live, a faculty live in a world where you have to be extremely productive, you know, and it's not a race, it's a marathon, so you have to be extremely productive over 50 years, not over 10 years, and we're training CIS students who are able to function in the same system. So there's a lot of downside. The upside is you win by publishing. So it's in a very, very productivist system. And is this worth, personally, as a woman, who, um, you know, I mean, I was socialized in France at the time when very few top faculty knew how to train women. So I much rather function in a system where I have more freedom, precisely because it is a productivist system where publishing gives me freedom. I would not want to be in France where, you know, basically as a woman, being nice is the main thing that will help your career. You know, so, and I don't know enough about the, the Russian system to, uh, to, to have an opinion on it. I would say... Take a look at the proportion of women in the audience. <laughs> well, you have a lot of women here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I really like what the Italians have done. I think, you know, what, I, what is expert... I don't know what's exportable, but I know that if I were in a system where I feel like the uh, old gatekeepers are monopolizing the system and putting their mediocre peons in positions of power, I would maybe follow what the people at Sociologica in Italy have done to create a, a, a journal that is not under their control so that then you start spinning institutional means of diffusing your work that is not controlled by them and I would internationalize I would connect with, uh, you know, with uh, other academic systems and uh, uh, try to, to gain more autonomy this way. And really uh, try to change, uh, you know, the practices in the younger generation, the people who feel most frustrated by the current practices. But I'm really talking without much knowledge of the context here. You'll get more. Let's get more questions, okay. Catherine. I'm a student at a UK university, and we've actually been having a lot of discussions about neoliberalization of the university. About? The neoliberalization of the university. Yeah. Um, and so that is going to be increasing influence of the market on what counts as knowledge, and how knowledge is created. Um, some people, yeah, they even called it a sausage factory, you know, putting out sort of identical items that are, you know, taste the same, look the same. They are the same, and a lot of this I think has to do with this idea of the, the um, uh, impact number that um, academics are, are, are given according to where they publish. You know, the, the more well recognised and the more main, mainstream journals, the higher your number will be, and the more uh, well respected I guess you would be. Um, and I was wondering what uh, the relationship was between what, what you describe as a very sort of qualitative process of, of um, peer review and, and this very sort of quantitative. Um, uh, impact number. And also, to what extent does the market actually influence how this is the book goes? Yeah. Well, the uh, British case stands uh, a little bit as the epitome, I think, of the neoliberal uh, audit society. And uh, interesting, and yeah, so it's, it's really a case in itself, I think, in the extent to which uh, quantitative, uh, the quantification of performance has. Basically, I'm very much opposed to it. I think it makes sense for fields such as chemistry, where you have an extremely high level of consensus about the ranking of journals and such. I spent last year, in, I was on, on sabbatical in France, so I spent a lot of time there conversing with colleagues about uh, the push there toward quantification and it creates totally absurd situations where uh, committees are appointed to create rankings among sociology journals, rankings that in fact are largely arbitrary because you have Revue Française de Sociology and then a bunch of journals that are each tied to to various, uh, you know, subgroups and it's very uh, difficult to, uh, to differentiate them. Um, so, I'm, my, this is a context in which Sarkozy is constantly putting down academics for being unable to evaluate themselves. I'm a big proponent of peer review because I think peer review is the key to professional autonomy, which is the key to professional status. 
So I think by, in, in France, there was a lot of union people who were opposing peer review because their argument is, if you agree to do this, you're being the puppet of Sarkozy. Uh, my position is much more nuanced than this, is that if we don't police ourselves, we will be policed by uh, academic managers of the type that you have at the, in Great Britain who don't know anything and they're imposing numbers because they're unable to make judgments of quality. And I feel like it really, the, being able to make judgments of quality is the conditions for the survival of our disciplines. In, in American sociology, sometimes, I hope there's no one here who would be associated with this, we, it, 20 years ago, there was, you know, mainstream American sociology that came out of the big quantitative departments in the Midwest, Michigan, Wisconsin, etc., where the criteria of evaluation were, the, no, the criteria of performance was how many papers in ASR and AJS. And the mid-level departments that didn't have strong confidence in their own ability to judge would simply count the number of papers you had when you came up for, for tenure, which for me is the epitome of mediocrity. At the minimum, you know, faculty should be able to read the papers and determine whether or not debate, whether or not the papers are significant. So, uh, you know, I would certainly be an advocate that, you know, I mean, if we're a world of, of experts who know anything about the knowledge produced in the field in which we function, we should be able to de deliberate. So that's my, my position. So in that respect, I think the UK went totally the wrong way. <laughs> wow, okay. So you're in the wrong country. <laughs> Michelle, uh, I would like to mobilize the role of the chair because I want to have this exchange in public rather than over dinner. <laughs> and it is the first time when I came to read your text, not because of pleasure, but because of work requirements, was when we were working with Laurent uh -huh. de Venot and we had to read comparative cultural sociology. Now, that was a comparative study of what is a worth and uh, <clears throat> the way we usually take Laurent here is something like a post Bourdieuian turn in French sociology, you know, together with Luc and together with Bruno. Uh, now, when I read this paper, uh, I really like it uh, in a sense at the gut level because I think 70% of the people in the audience do not understand it, not because of English, but because they never were uh, evaluating others. This is part of the professional careers when they cross the table, when they cross the threshold, the boundary, and become professors. And I think this is a big discovery for me because it basically illuminates what I always knew, but I never knew before I read it. Mm -hmm. You kind of, you put it into, you articulate the practices which for us are so widespread that we don't even notice them very often, but that's what Lena felt, I think, from my department, and I as well. That's the way we do evaluate our students in our discussions, that's the way we do evaluation, we're part of international panels. So the sense of recognition was total. Now, on the other hand, when I finished reading it, I said, well, but what about Bourdieu? I mean, we're all this kind of post bourdieu stage, but what about Bourdieu? Professor Lamont is articulating four rules which more or less structure the feel for the game, the practice, and if we go one step back, we all know the Bourdieuian criticism of anthropological studies, which try to uh, enumerate the rules of the practice. Because of course, uh, his question would be, how would you really aspire to pin down in four rules all the variety of practical reactions of these completely different people? Who should have not you be? Should you not have been producing a habitus for uh, academic evaluation? And then the question is, what would be the comparison of the habiti, right, or the habituses? Mm -hmm. Was it Finnish and American habitus, or is it class-based habitus? Like, uh, how do we forget about Bourdieu in this type of study? That was my question. I mean, how do we get away from the obvious criticism that you? kind of captured the universe of uh, successful moves in the game and four rules, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the book is in part, you know, a lot of my work has been a critique of Bourdieu, in part because I studied with him when I was 20, and when I started growing up, all I could do was define my, myself against a father. So, um, so this is anti-Bourdieu? It is anti-Bourdieu to the extent that, you know, the beginning of the book is something like Bourdieu says that as academics we're all moved by the state of the field and by our need or our libido 
libido scientists, which would be to impose criteria of evaluation that are in line with our own work so that we can dominate a field. I have, a, I think, a more complex and more empirically adequate understanding of uh, the human uh, being, which is that uh, domination is not the only thing we want to do in life. We actually also want to have fun, we want to love, we want to belong. I think my approach is much more empirically grounded in my own experience than his. I think that his concept of the self is a reflection maybe of the world, a Parisian, extremely small academic world that has very sum, zero sum. So, you know, really, this is why the argument is, you know, evaluation is about uh, uh, pleasure as well. People agree to serve because they love to see brilliant mind at work. And there's a lot of fun, you know, that people have from spending two days in learning from each other. The rules, I think on the one hand, you don't have, uh, I don't use the concept of habitus in the book because I think that his concept of habitus is far too reductivist. He focuses mostly on what people learn at an early age. That's irrelevant here. Uh, in some ways, the disciplines are similar. In other ways, they are different from each other. Um, he would describe a lot of the language that I document about the gratuit, this disinterestedness of those uh, academics as a, a lie making or making virtue of necessity. I, I'm not a skeptic when it comes to morality. In this respect, my work is much more in line with uh, the work of Boltanski and Tevno in that I take for cash. And I think how people represent reality to themselves is not an illusion. I give it, you know, in my view, reality is half made of the representations we have of it. Therefore, you cannot discredit it as illusory. It's part of reality. If I go around and saying, you know, that uh, the academic field is only driven by self-interest and my desire to dominate, well, then you end up living in a world that is like this. And part of me is a little bit more of a, you know, uh, I chose to be an academic instead of selling shoes because I thought it would be a qualitatively better life. Therefore, to just uh, try to turn academia into a world of little paranoiac people is not very interesting to me. So I think the perspective is quite different from the Bolzusian approach. No, it is different, and that's why I just wanted you to articulate the difference and also to maybe produce a theoretical argument why one can still right now think that one can boil down the richness of practice to enumerating it in four rules, which Bourdieu would never say is possible. And your answer was because habitus is a concept of domination. And that's why yeah. I don't want to do it. Yeah. And actually, I think, you know, I mean, here I presented four rules, but in some ways the book is... I think of it as multi-dimensional in that I take a great many tacks to attack the same problem in the various chapters. Mm -hmm. So I like to think that at the end of the day, the picture of academia that I provide is, is multi-dimensional. Um, and one of the argument is also that disciplines, now my normative takeaway is very much that discipline should shine under different lights. That is, it's ridiculous to uh, evaluate sociology under criteria by which economics mm -hmm. is brilliant and vice versa. So the message, if any way, and uh, the normative message is one of uh, intellectual pluralism, but it's also one, and that's where I, I'm very bold to see in that, you know, by reflecting more explicitly on what we do, we might be able to do it better. So that if you tell academics, okay, you're forced to, to, to uh, uh, abstain yourself in your if your students are being evaluated or your colleague, but not the best student of your best friend, then it brings about a collective conversation about the practice that may lead to an improvement of the academic world. So at that level, I think I'm a little bit of a voluntarist or an idealist, you know. I do hope that just as for Bourdieu, learning about cultural capital helps working class people do better at school because they become more aware of the domination they face, I hope that becoming more aware of what we do when we evaluate and, for instance, distinguish between idiosyncratic 
judgment and judgment of competence. If we were systematically asked to make that distinction, we might end up with an academic world where, you know, quality is, where peer review is better practiced, so. Okay, well, yeah. I mean, we've <laughs> publicly stated your relation and non-relation to Bourdieu right now, which yeah. we don't. Uh, Victor had the second question, which I initially, initially banished, but then maybe there may be some students with questions. Okay. It looks like you are studying particular epistemic cultures from the point of view of another epistemic culture, which is somehow becoming a meta culture or culture of cultures. So, uh, and uh, even if you gave up the concept of frame, it is still has a lot of things to do with the framing of framing because you use those metaphors like this is deliberative democracy and this is court of justice. So you still use all those mechanisms. And for me, it's more like epistemological puzzle because I never could understand the epistemological basis of sociology of sociology. What actually gives this kind of perspective some uh, interesting privileged VIP access to uh, to understanding of understanding? Sorry. So I, I would just like to hear your answer. Because Michael Sekalov already is getting yeah, so pissed off. When yeah. No, you're totally right. At that level, I'm a Bolduzian in that I want to understand the conditions of possibility of the universe that I'm studying. And, I'm, and I feel entitled to be that, do that in part because I feel, as I was reading the book, uh, writing the book, knowing that it would be writ read by non-sociologists in a context in which the legitimacy of sociology in the US is not as strong as it could be, I wanted to show people what, the, what I thought is a good sociological analysis would look like. And many, many humanists never read sociology, and many physicists never read sociology. So for them to see, okay, that's what the sociological uh, analysis of peer review looks like. So it's true, no question. I like your expression, you know, a VIP epistemology. It's true that there is a kind of, uh, um, it's, not, it's not entitlement. I would, I would say it's a kind of, uh, Informed, uh, informed knowledge of what of what is the added value of this kind of analysis, which I'm ready to I contend and I'm ready to defend, is superior to the native's perspective, analytically. So yeah, but you know that's what I do for a living. You know, why not? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, we're sort of having a short break, but I think we're not going to have any short break because we have an intensive discussion, and I also would like to give Michelle a chance to answer to what Mikhail will say about her sociology. So